is this thing on? Yeah, okay. Hello, I am the sheriff, as you can see, and I assume you're aware an awful incident occurred in this very spot at some point last week. All I can say at this time is that we're currently investigating it and I will bring you more as it- Oh, sorry about that. Hello? You found what? No. Where? I'll be right there. Oh, sorry about that. Oh. Now, you're probably wondering what just happened. Why did I vanish? And the truth is, you've just become another victim to a Disney sequel fake out death. Except this isn't really a, a Seamus Gorman video fake out death. And while I imagine you're desperate to know what this must mean for the canonical storyline, unfortunately, there's a much more important missing persons case right now. Because Tinkerbell is currently locked up in a birdcage in this terrifyingly animated nine year old girl's room, and you know what that means? It's time for Tinkerbell and the Great Fairy Rescue. The Great Fairy Rescue? I wouldn't go that far. Now, I don't know why it does this, but it really builds itself up to be quite something, as it tells the story of a fairy meeting a human for the first time ever. Because apparently, before Tinkerbell about got there, no one was even remotely tempted to go near humans. There's a rule that fairies can't interact with humans and everyone just sticks by it. You know, even though they never explain why they have this rule, and I gather spoilers for the end of the film by the way, they just scrap it with no questions asked eventually. But anyway, back to the start, because this film takes place during summer. Now I don't want to keep going on about this canonical Peter Pan timeline, okay. I kind of do, but Terence says right at the start, Ready for your first summer on the mainland? And then he flies away, not appearing again until the very end of the film. Julie noted, but if this is Tinkerbell's first summer, how did the last film being The Lost Treasure take place in autumn? Like, I'm no genius, but I'm pretty sure summer comes before autumn. Matter of fact, I don't think you can have autumn without summer. And no, it can't happen before because the annoying squeaking bug from The Lost Treasure is in this film. I don't know, this timeline is just getting more complicated. I'm going to assume when he said her first summer on the mainland, he means she didn't go to the mainland last summer, and therefore this is technically her second summer, and therefore it does take place after, nine months after it specifically, but I don't know. Now some of you may be wondering, what do fairies do during summer? And the answer is, they go to fairy camp, which is located in this tree somewhere in the English countryside. And what do they do at fairy camp? My guess is that we'll never know, because before anything can happen, this human family arrive that live in this cottage nearby, and Tinkerbell, despite being warned not to go anywhere near them... We stay away from humans. Oh, Iridessa. <laughs> Tinkerbell knows that. Don't you? I mean, at least there's a bit of self-awareness that she just doesn't know some things when it's convenient to the plot. And self-awareness is good. Well done, people who made this film. As she decides she doesn't care about the rules and flies up to this cottage where they're staying. And before we get into this vicious kidnapping that's about to occur, let me tell you who this family are and what they're like. Firstly, we have the dad. He studies butterflies and is also the villain. Yeah, you know, those two things usually come hand in hand. Just another evil butterfly man. But you see, as a scientist, he's all about the facts. You know, a classic facts don't care about your feelings grumpy man that no one likes. And I bring this up because his daughter is a big believer in fairies. And our introduction to their relationship is her telling him that butterfly wings are actually painted by fairies, which is technically correct in this universe, but he doesn't take it well. Rational people consider a belief in fairies to be quite foolish. Like, bro, lay off of it. She's nine. You don't need to take this as a personal attack. She has an imagination. Why do you have a problem with this? However, witnessing this interaction infuriates Tinkerbell, who decides to reveal herself to the girl, completely exposing the existence of the fairy world. Yeah, I may have been exaggerating a bit when I said it was some vicious kidnapping. She just builds a little fairy house that Tinkerbell and Vidya find, and Tinkerbell accidentally gets locked inside, which I know some of you are probably thinking, accidentally, we know what Vidya's like, but... No, Vidya's had a bit of a redemption arc, it must have happened off screen, but everyone seems cool with her now. However, all this leads to the girl finding Tinkerbell, and her excitement is immeasurable. Fairy! The animation this covers just... Anyway, that brings us back to where we started. Tinkerbell's been locked in a birdcage in this girl's bedroom, meanwhile Vidya's gone back to fairy camp to warn everyone and get help. And with that, we have the OK Fairy Rescue. And I'm gonna have to address the obvious elephant in the room. This film has basically taken its plot from Toy Story 2. One of the greatest films of all time. You've got the main character getting kidnapped and separated from all their friends while the rest of the gang team up and head out on a mission to save them, eventually leading to a big climax with a high-speed chase. We'll get into that later, because I imagine there are a lot of you thinking, well, since you love Toy Story 2 so much, you probably think this film's great, Seamus. 
But no, unfortunately, I don't. I think they've taken this formula and done it pretty ineffectively. And it all comes down to two things. Firstly, the stakes. You see, in Toy Story 2, Woody's been kidnapped by a collector who spends the film trying to ship him off to Japan. And we know if this happens, he'll never be able to see Andy again, which is pretty high stakes as it is. Not even to mention that it goes a whole nother step further with these other toys we'll meet. He'll go back into storage if he just leaves and you begin to root for them as well. And you don't need me to tell you Toy Story 2's great. Meanwhile, here, Tinkerbell is free to go as she pleases. The girl just wanted to meet a fairy and happily sets her free on multiple occasions. And the thing that keeps the plot going is, I'm not joking here, the rain. Because a little bit of fairy lore for you, fairies can't fly in the rain. It makes their wings wet and it just can't be done. Meaning Tinkerbell can't simply fly away and the other fairies have to build a boat that they somehow sail down a stream to the house that's been created from a few hours of rain at most. I have no idea how that works, but my point is that there's no real imminent danger. What's the worst thing that can possibly happen? Tinkerbell has to stay with this girl for a few hours. That's literally the worst come scenario. And the second thing I think it fails at is a killer middle act. I've said this before. I think Toy Story 2's middle act is the best part of the entire entire film. You have Buzz and the rescue team having one adventure with the crossing the road scene, going inside a toy store with the Barbies, the Buzz Lightyear, Zerg, and climbing the lift shaft. And then alongside that, Woody's having his own personal growth story, learning about his past and other toys' perspectives of humans, including a tragic tale of what could potentially happen to him, not even mentioning the greatest scene in cinematic history. Honestly, the fact it's taken me 13 episodes to find a way to rave about Toy Story in this series is actually quite an achievement for my standards. And the point is, both of these storylines are really interesting, whereas with Tinkerbell, not so much. She spends the movie teaching this girl about what fairies do, as she writes a paper about it, because we all know what nine-year-old girls love to do more than anything, write papers. Only thing is, the girl can't understand Tinkerbell, and when she speaks, she just hears bells. Would you get it? Tinker. Bell. Yeah, and I don't know why I got so frustrated about this, whether it was just genuine annoyance or jealousy, but the way she picks up on everything Tinkerbell's trying to say when she can't understand her is just... Like, she'd go, what's your name? Tinkerbell would pretend to use a hammer and point at a bell, and she'd be like, oh, Tinkerbell, of course. How a fairy's born? Oh, well, that's a little bit complicated, but uh, let me jiggle around this baby a bit, and oh, wow, she works out almost immediately. My point is, I didn't find this storyline that interesting. We already know all of this stuff about fairies, and in the meantime, the other characters who do get into some crises on their boat while trying to get to her, only thing is, I feel like it was all completely avoidable. Like, for example, they go crashing down this waterfall, and if you pause right here, you might think, oh, well, it's over for them at this point, and they're dying. But no, they have a water fairy with them who's able to bend water. I don't know what the technical term is, which is great and all, but don't you think that would have been useful before you went crashing down the waterfall? Then Vidya gets stuck in the mud and can't get out, somehow leading to a car almost hitting them, which I just can't work out how Vidya got so badly stuck in the mud that she couldn't get out, but no one else had any trouble whatsoever. Like, the mud's got to at least be consistent. And when they eventually reach the house, the cat begins to attack them, so they build a bridge out of flying crockery to get to the other end of the room, and oh, that was okay to be honest. It was a fun little scene, but unfortunately, this middle section took up like half the film, and now we're finally into the final act, which was okay, but way too short. Tinkerbell teaches the girl to fly, and I swear she's flying for over a minute before she goes, I'm flying! No way! Did you just work that out. But then when her father, the evil butterfly man, comes upstairs, she decides to not fly in front of him and prove fairies exist. So when she eventually does tell him she's been flying, he doesn't believe her because the fairy dust is worn off. And again, he takes it really badly. Like, I don't know why he has this vendetta against this child, in his view, having an overactive imagination, but he probably starts ripping down her fairy pictures like, Jesus Christ, man. And then Tinkerbell finally decides to reveal herself to him. And now, because he's gone full villain, I guess, isn't really mystified by this fairy and just just sees her as a new discovery he must bring to the museum. But just before he traps Tinkerbell, Vidya selflessly throws herself in the way leading to her being captured instead and he rushes off to London with her. Which, just for the record, most of the vehicles in London are actually horse-drawn carriages and his automobile kind of stands out. Setting the date of this film, I'm gonna say in 1903-1904. Just something to keep in mind when we eventually start dating that canonical timeline. And yeah, sorry. So since all the fairies can't fly in the rain, they very cleverly decide to give all of their fairy dust to the girl, who can fly in the rain, and they all get in her pockets as she flies off to London, which you're probably thinking, wow, that's gonna take a while to get there considering she's in the countryside, but no, she's in the countryside like a mile away from Westminster, which, yes, that's exactly how London's laid out. I can vouch. And just as the evil butterfly man runs to the museum doors, his daughter comes 
flying in and apparently that's what convinces him of the existence of fairies. Not the literal fairy he has in a jar in his hands right now. And now because he believes in fairies he has a complete change of heart, no longer wants to bring Vidya in for scientific research and goes off flying with his daughter and the rest of the fairies. The end. 3.6 out of 10. Not nearly enough Terrence. But also, I felt like this was the worst out of the Tinkerbell movies so far. I don't know, it was just kind of... Why? Yeah, I don't know, I thought this was a lot more boring than the other two, but fear not! This video isn't going to be a complete slander of Tinkerbell movies, because I actually quite liked the next one. It's the secret of the wings! I guess Tinkerbell isn't important enough for the title anymore, which, you know, I respect it. And this title was actually very clever, but you don't realise why it's clever until the very end of the film, and that's what kind of makes it clever. But firstly, there have been three Tinkerbell films so far. One in spring, one in autumn, and one in summer. You'll never guess when this one takes place. Autumn, again. I'm joking, kind of, like, it is during autumn, they're changing the seasons to winter, and they never actually reach winter in the film, because this film, they don't actually ever go to the mainland at any point. You see, the story revolves around the Winter Woods, which is where the Winter Fairies live, because apparently winter just gets its own set of fairies, and if you think that's odd, because does that mean there's a main set of fairies that work three seasons a year, and then the Winter Fairies just show up for one and get the rest of the year off? Yes. That's pretty much it, but I do want to give them a bit of credit, because technically they did introduce the Winter Fairies in the first film. And there's actually a good reason to why they're not allowed to interact. The main fairies, or the warm fairies, can't survive the cold weather of the Winter Woods, and the Winter Fairies can't take the heat! So therefore it's forbidden for any fairy to cross the border. But then again, Tinkerbell doesn't care about the rules. We covered that in the last film, and that hasn't changed. She actually crosses the border claiming the woods were calling me. And you're saying this came before the Frozen films? Huh. I'm not saying anything, I'm just... Interesting, isn't it? Anyway, a thing to note is that the change in temperature mostly has an effect on their wings, and Tinkerbell start going all sparkly and cold when she crosses the border, meaning she has to go visit a fairy doctor after this venture and get her wings reheated. But she never gets an answer to why her wings were sparkly, and therefore goes to a fairy library to seek it out, which I don't want to nitpick, but these things did not exist in the first film. When did the society become so developed? But typically, the page she needs in the book has been eaten by a bookworm, like, a worm that eats because we've all been there, and the guy who wrote the book and has the answers lives in the Winter Woods. So to get the answer to why her wings were sparkling in the Winter Woods, she has to go to the Winter Woods. Everyone on the same page? So she hides in a snowflake basket being carried to the Winter Woods by a snowy owl. No, don't say it. But unfortunately, she got the run towel, and her basket just gets dropped right in the open, and all the winter fairies come to see what happened. However, not one of them decides to go check the tipped over basket she's hiding in. And that gives her the perfect opportunity to sneak through the Winter Woods and find the guy who wrote the book. Yeah, it was literally that easy. And conveniently, just as she walks in, he's speaking to another fairy called Periwinkle on the winter side, whose wings also lit up yesterday, and as they go closer to each other, their wings start sparkling again. What could this mean? No, before you think it, they're not like soulmates or anything, they're sisters. Which was a bit of a letdown to be honest, because I found out the other day after releasing my first Tinkerbell video, the Tinkerbell movies have a massive gay fan base, and I'm honestly surprised I didn't realise that. Like, they're fairies, Seamus. How did you not clock onto that? But yeah, if you found something out about yourself from watching Silver Mist as a kid? Trust me, you aren't alone. My comments assure me of that. But I was hoping they'd get some representation that wasn't just Clank turning into a rainbow. That happens in this film too, but no, instead we get this super convenient light show that tells them the exact story of what happened. You see, apparently they were both born from the same baby's laugh but got separated on their way into Pixie Hollow, which... I thought this whole sequence was convenient enough as it is, but now you're just making stuff up. We saw this laugh happen in the first film and there wasn't two fairies coming off of it, but you know what, who cares? They're sisters! However, the Lord of Winter, who I'm starting to think might be the bad guy, is suspicious that a warm fairy may have entered the Winter Woods, playing the classic it's for their own safety they can't come here card, you know, despite the fact Tinkerbell has been completely fine so far. And in the meantime, we get a fun little Tinkerbell and Periwinkle bonding scene. The only way these movies know how. Cheesy American pop song! I swear, I think these movies spent half their budget on getting, like, pop artists to perform songs for them, because... It's insane. Also, just worth taking a quick note, despite the fact there's a strict rule about no warm fairies being allowed in the winter woods, not one of them seems to care that Tinkerbell's there. Matter of fact, they go out of their way to show her a good time. Respect. However, after having a great day together, by nightfall it starts to get very cold and they decide Tinkerbell should go home just to be safe. But that isn't the end, because she ropes Periwinkle into her troublesome ways and convinces her to sneak over to her side tomorrow, and that's what happens. They produce this snow-making machine so she can survive the warm, however, the way it works confuses me. Like, they grate ice, and that makes sense. That's definitely not how it works, but also, 
the ice just doesn't melt. Like, they run out of ice before it melts. Which, like, how warm could it be if the ice isn't melting? Well, enough for Periwinkle to collapse, apparently, and just as they arrive back at the Winter Forest border, the Lord of Winter happens to show up and quite calmly tells them both their antics could have got them killed and... Yabbity yabbity yabbity, you know what he's gonna say. Okay, so maybe he didn't come out and show his true evil colours, which kind of surprised me, but still. And then, even more surprising to me, Queen Clarion shows up for the first time in this movie and says that it's actually her rule. I still don't trust Lord Winter though, and look what he does immediately after everyone leaves! Oh no, I just accidentally started a snowstorm on the warm side of Pixie Hollow! That's my impression of you, Lord Winter. However, this film did something that a lot of films don't do, let alone Disney sequels. It caught me off guard twice, and I was genuinely intrigued and clueless to where it would go from it. Is this unironically a good film? Usually I can do a guess what happens in this predictable Disney sequel here, but this sequel isn't very predictable. I don't know what's gonna happen. So they follow up this scene with both Queen Clarion and the Lord of Winter simultaneously telling the sisters a story about why traveling across the border is so dangerous, as apparently there were once two fairies who were in love but lived on separate sides of the border. However, their love was so strong they crossed the border to be together, which led to one of these fairies' wings breaking, meaning they couldn't fly anymore. And we're back to it! Guess what happens in this predictable Disney sequel? Who do you guys think this story, the Queen Clarion and the Lord of Winter, telling is actually about. Wait, sorry, actually, I don't know if this is that obvious from how I've told it, but all the pieces are there for this to be Queen Clarion and the Lord of Winter. Like, they share a few looks in that scene together. They both know the story and live on opposite sides of the border, and the clincher is that we never actually see the Lord of Winter's wings as he flies on the back of an owl, implying he's the fairy with a broken wing. And I would be very critical if they tried to play this as an oh, big twist reveal, because there are far too many clues to try and do that, but in fairness, they don't. It's a very subtle reveal more than anything, and doesn't end up massively playing into the final storyline. Like, it just, they kiss at the end, but that's pretty much it. However, detour aside, and back to the crisis at hand, because there's currently a snowstorm hitting Pixie Hollow, potentially destroying life as we know it. It's all good though, they managed to destroy the snowmaking machine and everything isn't solved. You probably thought that was too easy, and yes, it was. For some reason, after destroying the snowmaking machine, Pixie Hollow just starts to freeze, so an all-out mission to save the pixie dust tree begins. And that's when Tinkerbell realizes something about how Periwinkle's frosting works keeps plants alive. So in one last attempt to save Pixie Hollow, she flies into the Winter Woods. And the Winter Fairies cross the border with her frosting the Pixie Dust Tree, saving Pixie Hollow. Or, you know, at least most of it. The autumn section was pretty much done for, but, you know, they don't mention that issue again. Eh, autumn's an overrated season anyway. And then, almost immediately after this, the sun comes back out and everything melts again. Which, honestly, where did the sun go in the first place? You know what? It doesn't matter, because in one final big twist, Tinkerbell reveals her wing broke when she flew into the Winter Woods, and I know that isn't going to be a consequence as severe as this. They're gonna resolve it somehow. But oh wow, she sacrificed herself. And then, yeah, apparently because her and Periwinkle are sisters with identical wings, that fixes it somehow. Wait, the secret of the wing? I get it! And now there's proper border control in place to make for safe passage between the Winterwoods and Pixie Hollow, and everyone lives happily ever after. Except Terence, who's been very unfairly cut out of both these films for some reason. Like, he briefly appears at the start and end of both films, but I don't even think he has any lines in this one. Either way, with or without Terence, I still think this was the best Tinkerbell movie so far, and I'm gonna give it a very strong 6.2 out of 10. Which is a very high score for me. I've only given one Disney sequel a higher score, and that was Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time. This was no Cinderella 3 A Twist in Time. And, uh, I guess, yeah! Thanks for watching this video! And with that, this video is done. But I imagine for those of you still watching, there's an unanswered question lingering in your mind. Why did I vanish? And the truth is, I'm done. I don't want to be the world's leading expert on the Disney sequels anymore. I think it's time to pass the title on to someone else, someone more worthy. You can finish this series. I'd just like to say I, Cameron Paperman, would happily volunteer to take up this mantle and, you know, what? I'll prove how good I'd be for it. I'm gonna do the outro for you. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like. You can subscribe to my channel by clicking, I mean, you can subscribe to Seamus's channel by clicking here. You can watch another video by clicking here. You can check out Seamus's Patreon by clicking here and in the description down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Achoo! Oh.